Hi, everyone. My name is Gorman Bichard. I'm the executive director of NH Docs, and I am very proud to present uh, a longtime friend of mine, uh, Adrian Correa. Adrian and I met when I was doing a film called Friends with Benefits, uh, the real Friends with Benefits, not the commercial one, uh, back in what, 2007, I'm going to say. Yeah. And we have been friends since I, there is no one else who could speak the language of film like Adrian. Uh, I think that's why I love having conversations with him. We can just be talking about, I can reference some crazy French film from 1954 and he'll go, oh yeah, that scene where it's, uh, and likewise, <laughs> I think so, which is, uh, which is kind of nice and refreshing today uh, to, to find a true fellow film geek. So uh, without further ado, I am going to, leave and turn this over to the very capable hands of Adrian. Adrian, welcome. Thank you for doing this. Thank you, Gorman. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, so there we go. So it's, I wanted to start today and uh, talk about um, cinematic camera techniques in a documentary setting. And um, the discussion is going to basically be simply about, you know, specifics in terms of camera and lighting movement when and if necessary and just um, the thoughts on subjectivity and objectivity uh, I have my chat open so um, you guys can uh, ask questions when you feel it's appropriate I don't and I, I can pick up and drop stuff as we go uh, I am um, I am a cinematographer I've been doing this for over eh, just about 20 years and uh, and uh, like Gorman said we met uh, uh, doing narrative and then uh, I ended up kind of transitioning into doing some documentary work with Gorman for a number of years. I've done, I did doc work and then uh, I'm pretty much a full-time narrative cameraman now in terms of uh, television and film. So um, a lot of the techniques that we're gonna be talking about are specifically from film. Uh, the references will all be from film on, or television and then we'll put them into the context of, uh, of documentary work. So. Um, so what's, uh, the most basic thing we can talk about, uh, in terms of your works and documentaries, because it's not something that's constrictive to your equipment that you have, the camera that you own or uh, the camera that you're using is, or even the lights that you have that you're able to light your subjects with is framing. Um, framing is a, is a pretty specific art in terms of, uh, what you want to share and tell the audience. Um, framing actually creates uh, context for the interview um, if you're shooting a, a subject. And, um, and, and, and framing kind of is illustrative of the point of view of the filmmaker. And um, that's what can sometimes be the great benefit of it. And also in some regards, depending on who you are and the style of work that you wanna do, uh, the possible danger of it. Uh, um, because of the fact that every time you point a camera at something, every time you kind of place a camera in a specific position, um, even the focal length and proximity of lens to subject speaks uh, directly upon the thing you're shooting. You know, there's that, uh, the great, there's that great, uh, I can't remember the exact nature of the uh, effect, but it's, uh, it's not the Hawthorne effect, but basically the, you know, the simple act of shooting and uh, something basically ends up having an effect upon it. Um, but that's part of what art is, you know, and, and documentary as much as it about reportage and truth is about perspective. So um, the question for you is understanding it fully, the nature of what those choices are. And then as a filmmaker, documentarian, making the choices to be able to implement um, those choices with, with, with effect and the understanding of what that effect does. So, um, so I'm going to go run through some examples of, of framing uh, and and the choice in terms of like focal length and uh, position of camera in terms of proximity to subject or angles, and then we can just walk through what those certain choices, uh, what certain choices mean. Um, now, if uh, anyone doesn't know anything about lenses uh, specifically, uh, wide-angle lenses uh, are are characterized uh, by like uh, depending on how well they're made elements of distortion like a certain bending and the perspective of the frame and they also kind of expand space um, i'll show you examples of that 
and then there are more normal field of view lenses that are probably anywhere from you know, pretty narrow from about 40 to about 55 millimeters uh, in terms of a uh, focal length and those kind of represent a more a perspective that's more traditionally thought of as human perspective and uh, and that's basically a more realistic depiction of subject and relation to background and and, and set space and then there are telephoto lenses which are anywhere from like 75 millimeters and up and those tend to flatten imagery uh, so if you could see i have a pretty prominent nose you know and if you use uh telephoto lenses that ends up flattening faces they're 30 they're more traditionally thought of as more handsome lenses um because they kind of create this uh they flatten perspective a little bit more and compress space so that you end up uh things end up looking a little bit flatter and two-dimensional in a way so it's a little bit more painterly in terms of the representation of space if you want a, a pretty clear example of of this uh you can think of if you've ever watched the uh, the Stanley Kubrick movie Barry Lyndon, you know they use they use a lot of zooms and and uh, and handsome lenses to kind of like flatten space. So something very painterly about the photog uh, photography in that film. Um, and uh, if you if you look at that film and the way that they kind of shoot imagery, you know it doesn't have this kind of dynamic in terms of the expansion of space. It is it is flatter and much more like a like a painting. So. Um, we'll run through some examples now. I'm going to share my screen, and we can uh, we can go through some of these these photos. Um, and like I said, if anyone wants to ask a question, they can. So I'm going to start jumping around about uh, about framing framing. And as we talk about framing, we're going to start to incorporate some elements here that have. Uh, um, we'll start mixing in a bunch of of these different uh, subject matters in terms of focal length choices, that telephoto, normal, wide angle choice. Uh, and uh, aspect ratio in terms of the uh, the, uh, the the shape of the frame you're choosing, and uh, and we'll do a little bit with uh, with lighting, and, uh, and and shot structure and interviews. Um, so here we go. Uh, one second, guys. So 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 this is a photo by the great Elliot Erwitt. But um, so if you guys can, uh, I'll start uh, opening up some of these frames. Um, so in terms of aspect ratio, um, you know, there is, uh, there are choices that you can make that kind of speak upon, uh, you know, uh, the, the, you can make a choice in terms of your aspect ratio that says something very specific about how you feel about people and how you feel about people in that space. You know, if you think of, there was a uh, a documentary from a few years ago called uh, The Imposter that shot in a more cinematic aspect ratio of two, three, five to one, which is um, this aspect ratio from, if you see this frame from Paul Thomas Anderson's Magnolia. And this is characterized by, you know, like a, a very wide frame, but not much height. And uh, and and the really great thing about, about a two, three, five aspect ratio is that it allows you to get a good size shot of your subject in terms of like a, see if you can see a basically a medium sized frame on 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 uh, Tom Cruise here, but you still have a tremendous amount of 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 uh, of space and background with the with the with the subject matter. So if you're doing something that's say about uh, a chef, you know, and uh, you want to see exactly you want you don't want to just concentrate on their face you want to see them in the context of the kitchen you know something like a two three five frame allows you to be able to see all the nature of a setting in the context with the person uh, now in this particular example you can see that you know depending on how you put the subject in relation to the camera you can get a very different size frame or very different size uh, uh, position between the subject and their setting. You know, this is more of a medium close-up. This is technically a medium close-up, but it's in a wide setting. And at this point, you know, like the setting becomes as, almost as important as the subject. So, but part of this wide frame allows you to have audience, uh, your, your audience is able to concentrate on this size of the person in the context of their setting. 
And then if the lens was somewhere in this area of the table, you would end up getting the same size of subject, but it has a kind of really definitively different kind. This is, this is saying a completely different thing than what this is. So if you're trying to communicate to an audience something about your subject in space, you know, it's uh, the choice of framing can make a big difference. If you shot in the more traditional one seven eight aspect ratio, which is basically like the ratio of your your te your uh, like a LCD TV, basically a modern television, you know, you'd probably end up cutting this much of the frame off on the sides, you know, and then that that says something much more different in terms of subject and space than shooting in two three five. Um, oftentimes in film, you can end up. Um, Oftentimes in film, you can end up, excuse me, one second. Oftentimes in film, you can end up changing aspect ratios in the context of film um, for dramatic or comedic effect. And uh, that's something that's also been employed in documentaries. Uh, I don't think you're necessarily kind of constricted in modern storytelling. Uh, audiences, uh, especially for documentaries now, are so used to different kinds of subjects and style of storytelling that I think you could actively change aspect ratios and not really throw off an audience. Um, it is a choice. And then again, you have to decide whether or not that choice you're making is gonna have a detrimental effect upon the story you're trying to tell. Um, personally, for me as a, as, a, as a storyteller, I think all these tools are valid. Uh, I don't think anything you're trying to tell, any, any kind of truth that you're trying to represent within the context of, of cinematography um, you know, anytime you make a choice, you're, you're making some type of impact on the film. So, uh, for me, the choice of aspect ratio, you know, um, kind of says something very specific about subject and space. So if you have, if you're shooting a documentary where, because you can easily get a really nice close up in a two, three, five frame, but if there's something where, you know, the, the specific nature of this wide frame says something about, uh, the subject. And, and the person, then, then that's a and, and, and the setting. Then that's something. This is a really good aspect ratio for you to be able to combine the personal with the uh, environmental. Uh, so let's close this down here. Now, in terms of framing, you know, like if when I shoot with Gorman, sometimes when we do documentaries, we'll end up doing something where we most often have multiple cameras. Uh, you, you know, usually with Gorman, we end up shooting with small DSLRs, uh, which are basically look like small, basically the same size as this camera. I'm sure you guys are kind of familiar with DSLRs. This is actually an old film camera, but the sizing is, is similar. And what we'll end up doing is shooting multiple sizes at once. You know, we'll end up having, if this, for this example, this, this frame you see right here, if, uh, if we did something really artful here, you know, like uh, obviously in this frame from this movie, um, this frame communicates something really specific about uh, even though the person's on the phone and connecting with somebody, uh, this frame says something really specific about uh, emotional isolation. Uh, there's also something really specific about the color choices here in terms of the light that's in this person's face and, and the space in the room. Um, and like this kind of frame communicates something very, very different then if you just shot this like that size, if, it, if you shot this, you know, like this frame says something very specific about this person's kind of isolation and you're communicating something really emotional with such a stylized frame. Whereas this frame here doesn't really communicate the same type of emotional intent that this wide excessive headroom frame does, you know? But again, like that's, a, you. You, this is you as a filmmaker saying something very specific about this space. Imagine if you were speaking to somebody who was in, um, you know, a mental health facility, you know, and like if someone's in a mental health facility and you shot the room and the person like this, you know, that says something very, very specific about that setting, that subject together with that frame. Whereas if you shot a person in a mental health facility with this frame here, it doesn't really tell that kind of, doesn't really communicate more in terms of the story. You know, then it's about subject and about the subject matter at hand that you're discussing. 
you know, and the interview would provide the context or whatever you're talking about would provide the context for it. This really doesn't give you so much. Whereas this size frame in this space is a lot more psychologically. And that's the great power of what framing does is that it communicates so much psychologically that you really have to make a judgment. These are all choices. Wherever you put the camera cannot and should not be arbitrary. Um, you know, the, the very nature of photography is, a, is about kind of intent and effect. And every time you guys set down your camera in terms of how you're gonna frame something, you're saying something. So if you're in a space, you have to be very careful about what you're communicating with, uh, the lens you choose, where you put the camera, and where you put the subject. Um, and just from an aesthetic point of view, if you can see in this frame, you know, this guy is very close to the wall. Now, this is this kind of delves into lighting, but he's very close to the wall. And if you're going to light somebody right against the wall, you're going to kind of get this, if you can see it, this definitive shadow. That is really, really difficult to not that kind of get that kind of shadow if you're placing someone directly against the wall and you have to key them. Key them meaning you have to key light them. It's very difficult to not have this kind of shadow work on a wall. Um, so if you're, if that's something that, that from an aesthetic point of view bothers you, just know that putting people against walls, knowing that you have to light them, you know, you're going to have to light them. And if it's something that, that kind of, uh, lighting somebody, if that, that makes you feel like you're manipulating something too much, seeing this shadow kind of throws you off or feels cheap, know that you need some separation between subject and, and the background to be able to lose those kind of shadows. Even if you had a key light very high, like where the cursor is here, you'd still end up getting a shadow down here. So, you know, be conscious of your subject against walls if you're trying to hide your lighting and make that look a little bit more polished. Um, and so let's uh, talk a little bit more about uh, backgrounds for depth. Now, if you can see behind me here, the, uh, the wall is, right against me hold on a second i'll stop sharing for a second so if you can see this this wall is right behind me right so just in terms of making things look cinematic there's not a heck of a lot of depth here you know the wall is maybe about 12 to 14 inches behind me and it's i'm very square and symmetrical to the space you know, so if you're interested in symmetry, maybe that's great, but there's not a heck, a lot of, a heck of a lot of depth here. It's a very kind of flat image. Now, if you're, if you want something to be flat, you know, that's also a choice. Like if you're talking to somebody who is very kind of monotone or very kind of like flat to camera in terms of their expression or their outward action, um, then if you put them against a, a flat background, you're going to think about the fact that you're going to have this kind of symmetrical flat background against someone who's very monotone and kind of and down. Then you end up kind of creating a frame that sometimes ends up becoming boring um, because of the nature of the subject combined with the frame you chose. So you have to be very careful about that stuff. That's why knowing your subject matter before, it's new, knowing your subject beforehand if possible, or at least just talking to them and getting an idea of how they speak can directly impact about how you frame for cinema. Now, like, if you just even turn me this way, you know, I'm like, now you're talking about creating a heck of a lot more depth just because you changed the angle by 45 degrees. I mean, this is, it goes from there, you know, which is a little bit more symmetrical and flat to that becoming, you know, much more dynamic in terms of space. You know, now there's nothing on these walls, so that doesn't help. But that's just because this place just got painted, so I'm sorry. But, um, you know, like if you just change slightly a bit of the angle in terms of height, imagine if I was looking off at Gorman or somebody here talking here, that's a very different kind of uh, energy. It's a very different kind of thing that you're communicating in terms of space dynamics between subject and, and background. So be very, very careful shooting things flat if you want to have depth behind them. Or if you actually like that absence of depth, you know, then sh shoot flatter and shoot symmetrical or uh, those kind of things are always kind of really specifically important to me when I choose camera position. Another thing, if you're, if you're looking like there's this window behind me that's significantly blown out. 
Now, if I was a young cinemat uh, cinematographer, documentarian, I didn't have any money, you know, like it'd be, I'd want to be near a window, right? Cause so that I can use that natural light, maybe just put a small card here to be able to like fill in my face um, to get a little bit of light. But, you know, like that's a pretty massive source behind me. The issue is, is that as you can see, there's not a heck of a lot of detail out here in terms of, uh, uh, just being able to see outside now there's a big white house over here so that doesn't help but in terms of positioning a subject if you're shooting right to my left here uh to my left um, is a, another window you know so if I, I knew i had this here you know and i moved my subject forward and just put them in front of the side of the window here you know now i can take advantage of this window's light here to be able to give me a more definitive key light on this side. And then you can use something really kind of uh, simple. If you wanted to kind of soften this light, you could put like a bed sheet or something in front of it to kind of wrap the light a little bit more. Um, taking advantage of your natural settings in terms of cinematography and documentaries is pretty important. You know, like window light can save you, you know, especially if, uh, if it's a nice cloudy day, you know, you know you're gonna have pretty consistent light for a good deal of time. You know, windows end up providing even a lot of uh, help in terms of like just lighting something and making it feel natural or, or cinematic. Um, so let's go over a few, a uh, couple more stills here in terms of uh, sizing. So I'm gonna use uh, one actor specifically, it is Joaquin Phoenix, because there's a couple different examples that are well suited. Um, you know, like, Oftentimes when you're lighting or you're choosing a, excuse me, if you're choosing a frame for a subject, you know, if oftentimes we'll, we'll end up going with something as a more of a medium size because you never kind of know how much a subject's going to move and whatnot. But if you're able to have multiple cameras and you need to choose multiple sizes, you know, like you don't have to always go with something as traditional as say this framing right now, you know, like choosing a frame like this that has, you know, a really kind of div it's, I mean, this is a pretty intimate, expressive close-up. I mean, that's because it's Joaquin Phoenix, but if you shot anybody this tight, it says something about what you're trying to communicate to someone about the intent. You know, like ECU's um, extreme close-ups, you know, say something very specific about the person in the frame. You know, in, in this kind of size invites intimacy and scrutiny. You know, so if there's something about the nature of a specific moment that you're trying to capture with someone and the nature of how they react on camera is really critical to you, you can end up extra, you can end up using something like an extreme close up because you want the audience to be really close to this person's face and really understanding the nature or want them to be totally wrapped by everything within the context of the storytelling of that person's face. Um, I've done this kind of sizing in documentaries before just because of the fact that uh, sometimes it ends up being something really interesting, even though it's such a subjective close up. I think sometimes it doesn't always have to be the same kind of framing, especially if you're doing an interview heavy documentary with a lot of different subjects. Varying the frame size really does kind of help create this kind of visual uh, energy to it. So you're not just cutting from left, right, left, right, left, right, in terms of a, a similar sizings of close-ups like the, the one you see of me here. Um, the, uh, also in terms of, where is it? So if you're doing, a, where is this? Also in terms of background, we'll go back to this here. You know, like, also, I want to talk a little bit about uh, eyeline. If you can see, you know, like, if you, eyelines are really specific in narrative cinema. Um, you know, like, the closeness of an eye to lens, you know, is, is really about connection of subject to audience. So choosing an eyeline is really, really important. You know, um, if there is a kind of thing where you're on a high angle close up, like this, you know, slightly higher, just to be able to take it out of normal kind of like eye level range. 
communicates something very, very different to the audience than something that, or an eyeline like this, that's very, very tight, almost directly into lens, but slightly over, or an eyeline like to this very tight, but slightly off center to lens. You know, you can just see it within the context of these three shots, you know, like what, forgetting dramatic implications of this particular element. The eye lines say something very, very different from, uh, from shot to shot. You know, like oftentimes when we're doing documentary interviews, you know, like I will look for eye lines and we'll talk to Gorman beforehand about you know, like how tight should this eye line be to camera. And then if we're having somebody interview somebody off camera, like I'll end up putting that person, if we want a really tight eye line, literally right, if the lens would be right here and the interviewer would be like right next to that lens to be able to draw that eye line as close to as possible, like something in the, the Joaquin Phoenix close up. This angle close up, you know, this is probably an alternative camera. If I was doing something like this here or here for the first camera, I might do something like this if I was doing two close ups to be able to get, you know, just a different eye line for, for coverage sake. But you can just see the nature of what this eye line does versus this. This is something much more specifically engaged and kind of uh, and, uh, subjective, frankly, than, than this. The angle might be a little bit more subjective because it's slightly higher, it's a little bit more stylized, but this eye line off camera detaches a little bit. Even if the subject matter is really, really difficult and specific, it could end up, this kind of off eye line ends up giving a little bit of a reprieve from the audience. You can just see if someone's talking to you in, with this kind of eye line and this kind of sizing, you know, it's a totally different kind of feel in terms of the way it's gonna impact the audience than this particular moment and this particular eye line. Now, regardless of someone, whatever they're talking about, psychologically, this is different connection to the audience than this. So like just, you can just tell psychologically what these frames do as you look at them, as opposed to something that's off lens, so. And, okay, and we'll just keep running through some of these things here. And actually not that one, apologies. Hold on, so I'm make sure and see if you guys have any questions here in a minute. So I just wanna talk about height of camera for a second. So, you know, like usually for the most part, interview, interview elements are done at almost at eye level. Uh, again, because there's something really objective to someone just looking directly, if a lens being directly at their eye level. Now this, now this particular shot, I've done documentary work where it has been slightly elevated, like that that last shot we saw with the uh, high angle close-ups here. You know, we'll run through a couple of these, but you know, like this is probably somewhere in right at like his diaphragm level. You know, in terms of sizing. I mean, you're seeing a heck of a lot more ceiling. You're seeing a, a heck of a lot more. Uh, uh, the, this is probably a like slightly wider than normal view lens. This is shot by Roger Deakins, who tends to favor 32 and 35 millimeter lenses for his mediums. He likes the proximity. He likes the lenses to be closer to people because he feels like it communicates more emotion narratively. Um, and you can tell that like that kind of feeling. Um, now this is a much more intimate, but again, this is a longer lens. So this has a much more kind of like flattening and kind of handsome effect on Andre Holland's face. Whereas this, there's something a little bit more immediate to this frame, you know, like it, it kind of doesn't flatten out the, the nature of, of Hugh Jackman's face. You know, it's got a little bit more, you can see a bit more of the angle and the detail in his nose to face work. And because of the fact that the lens is probably in this shot about four feet away from him, you know, this, there's a much more kind of immediate, less, not dreamlike, but less stylized appearance. This is almost stylized in the other way. There's almost this kind of like frantic immediacy to this sizing with the lens being a 35 millimeter lens being this close to subject. That's the thing about lens focal length choices and and proximity of camera to subject. There is a bit more, the closer the, for me, the closer the camera gets to subject, the kind of more immediate the connection is. 
um, you know, like it, there's, there's something as stylized to me in this frame as it is in this frame. You know, like I just feel like for me, sure, this is a very, very tight frame, and it, but it has a different kind of energy. You know, it feels a little bit more photographically specific. There's, there's, a, there's a more definitive drop off in terms of focus. It basically kind of floats just the face. Whereas this frame, this lens, regardless of the differences in lighting, there's something more specifically, I can feel the fact physically that he's closer to the lens. You know, more of him is sharper and in focus, but there's still a drop off to this background. And these are the same kind of uh, effects that you'd be achieving with a documentary subject. If you're looking to feel something in terms of the immediacy of somebody to lens, use wider lenses closer to subject. And then the question, the other question that comes into this is how is it going to affect your interviewer if you have a camera that close to them? I mean, it's a fair argument, but it's something you have to know as a documentarian if you have a specific language you're trying to create with your documentary, you know, then you have to find some other ways to be able to make maybe someone who isn't comfortable, comfortable in front of that camera. If you're looking to maintain photographic continuity with a style that you've chosen for your, for your documentary. So if you know your subjects are not going to be comfortable with the camera this close to them to achieve this effect, then you kind of have to find some way to make them comfortable. And usually over the course of interviews I've experienced with documentaries that if you can keep somebody, once people start talking and usually then they just, you know, they kind of forget about the camera. Um, the one exception to that is if, you know, you're doing something with a very, very wide lens, very, very close to subject, you know? So like, I'll give an example. So if you're doing a wide angle close up close, this is probably somewhere about a, 21 to 24 millimeter lens. This is from the, uh, the, the film Old Boy, this Korean film. Um, but this camera is probably about two and a half feet away from somebody. Um, would you ever shoot this kind of thing for a documentary? I mean, it's a big choice. It's a big choice. But imagine if you, and, and obviously the person would have to be careful with the camera this close. What I would probably end up doing if I did something this stylized for a documentary is that I would probably end up locking the camera off and not having an operator near it. And then just creating some separation between the camera, the interviewer who I pull back away from camera and then let the subject and the camera be in the space and move everybody back away from it. Um, now, why would you shoot this type of shot for a documentary? Well, like imagine if you were doing something like a documentary on uh, corrections officers in a supermax prison. You know, and imagine this was elevated and down underneath here it was uh, uh, an open yard where there were a bunch of inmates or basically a row of cells back here. And you had a corrections officer kind of very close in the frame here. You know, that says something very specific about the immediacy, immediacy of subject to lens. Also includes a great deal of the background in the same frame. And it has dynamic depth to it with this kind of dramatic diagonals going off into the background. Um, this is definitely a super stylized choice, but it's a really interesting frame. Now, if you're looking to shoot that kind of documentary, I don't think you need to consistently shoot this shot for every subject or, or piece that you were shooting, but you know, camera dynamics play a role in terms of your storytelling. They just do. So if you're doing something where you had this kind of like idea of having a person here and you know, you're talking about the dangers of the job or something like that. And, the dangers of, of, of the setting, something specific about where you put him in the setting or her in the setting, then, you know, like this kind of shot tells a very specific and kind of interesting story. Um, does that, is that appropriate for your style of documentary? Again, these are choices you have to, you have to, uh, you have to make. So um, let's keep going down here where we have. So I just wanted to show you another example of like a, a handsome or long lens close-up. Uh, this is from the movie The Master, Joaquin again. But um, this is probably a 150 uh, millimeter lens, maybe a little bit longer. And you can tell just how 
shallow the depth of field here is. He's basically his nose is in focus. The flat plane of his face is in focus. And this eye is in focus. This eye is already starting to drop off because of the slight tilt of his head. And basically by the time you get to his cheekbone here, like this is starting to drop off and fall away out of focus. Um, now you're talking about a very specific, he has a very prominent nose. And if you ever see a wide angle close up of Joaquin Phoenix, uh, I don't have an example here, but like his, his features are exaggerated. If you look at the movie Joker, there are quite a few wide angle close ups there that kind of accentuate the angularity of his face. Uh, this particular long lens shot, you can end up seeing like this almost kind of, this kind of shortens his features and it kind of makes his nose, which is tends to be more prominent in terms of it and angularity and, and, and size to his face. It almost kind of, this is not the perfect word, but it kind of normalizes the size of his nose and his face. It almost, it, you know, it renders his face in a very kind of pleasing and handsome light. So, but this is a very long lens close up, very, very specific in terms of focus, very, very specific in terms of style. And again, you see the, the this is almost directly, if not directly in lens, you know, communicate something very, very, very powerful to me. Um, now, like, is this appropriate for your subject? This is what, like, when I think of, of like a classic long lens close up, I think of something like this. And uh, th this also ties into something in terms of highlights. Um, you know, like if this was just a black space back here behind his head, you know, then it would just be his kind of face as the lone highlight. And it would end up drawing all the attention directly just to this front part of the foreground of this image. But because there's a highlight back here, you know, you end up being able to separate his face and create more depth because of the highlight. So when if you're setting up backgrounds for long lens stuff or even just something where you were trying to create some kind of depth, a highlight behind a head is actually a really good uh, choice. Um, if you look at something like um, your background, where is this? Where's flat background? So here's an example of a, uh, of a flat background. Oh, this is a much smaller kind of thing, unfortunately. So this is a shot of Woody Allen from one of his his films. I'm oh, sorry, this is really shitty uh, quality, but you can still tell the example in terms of depth. You know, this is a very flatly lit background. You know, like his everything is about the subject here. Everything, not nothing about the setting. And this is done for effect, you know, like shooting someone, if you were going to shoot them on a no seam or something just like a blank wall, you know, there's nothing to distract the person from uh, the audience, from anything else but the face, you know, like looking here, this is a much more dynamic close up. But like if you're trying to pull away artifice and make it all about the person, you know, like you can choose a really flat background to be able to draw specific attention that doesn't distract the viewer in any kind of way. Not as cinematically pretty as something like this, but the intent here, I think, is to keep this simply about the person. And that's a choice. It's not necessarily something that I would qualify as cinematic, but you know, something choices can be cinematic simply because of the fact that you're not making any kind of large artistic endeavor out of it. Um, the simplicity of it actually ends up being being the thing. So if you can look, there's another example of a interview type shot. You know, like there's not a ton of texture, but there's a slight bit of texture back here with the wall, but it's not lit very dramatically. And if you see like the example of not having that highlight in the background compared to uh, the Joaquin Phoenix close up, you know, where is that guy? Long lens. You know, this this shot, this highlight creates a great deal of space between him and and that, that background and the, the drop off in focus. This shot from the movie Loveless, Lovelace with the uh, Chloe Sevigny, there's a little bit of focus fall off, but her connective tissue in the setting to this wall is much less abstract than this 
this type of fall off of focus in this background, you know? So like this kind of medium sized uh, close up with this, this wall here ends up being a little bit more about the person and as opposed to the person in the space, even though you can see that there's a wall here, there's not a great deal of separation between her and this wall. So it ends up being a little bit more lived in, a little bit uh, less uh, stylized than, than this close up. You can imagine if you had a light back here and you put a gigantic slash of light across this wall, this, this seems to be a highlight here at the side, but if you did something much more definitive in terms of light and smashed the light into this wall here, you know, then it ends up becoming something a little bit more, uh, it's a little bit more specific in terms of a lighting choice and creating background. If we had no light on this wall, if you just had even less exposure, you know, or if this was a much tighter lens, all of this detail you'd kind of lose and it would end up just being a gray blob behind her head. And, uh, and that's a choice as well. But you know, like if, if, if you were looking to create some sense of space here, um, it's very, very difficult to be able to kind of create the idea of someone in a space if you don't have texture or highlight, it ends up being a little bit thinner, so to speak. Um, I'll stop sharing for a minute. Let's see what else we have here. You know, like another thing about framing is that, you know, like you don't have to strictly sit with, um, with standard sizing or, or standard shots of faces. You know, like you can create unbalanced frames or use of reflections or obstructions or those kind of details in the, within the context of your, your, your interviewing subjects. Like looking at something like this, uh, this is shot from the movie Swallow, shot by Kate Arismendi. And um, like if I was, I've done close up work in documentaries where we'll end up having the subject like right to the edge of frame. You know, and then we might have something back here that kind of creates a reflection or some other kind of separation. You know, like there's, there's all these arguments about what ends up pl playing in a more dramatic sense when you're doing a, a documentary or just something that just looks visually interesting. I've got friends who are documentarians who don't like using any of these kind of traits because they feel like it kind of affects their their objectivity. But, you know, you're still, even if you're trying to do the most objective thing you can, you're still making a choice about how you shoot something and where you put the camera. So if you're looking to kind of change up the nature of your coverage or the nature of how you frame and, and, and visually realize subjects, you know, like to me, these kind of choices aren't, uh, these things are out of bounds. Now, let's raise a, a question about if you were shooting someone who was accused of murder, or if you're t talking to somebody who was at the end of the day, unreliable based on some of your reporting or some of the research you've done, you know, like having a, a, a frame like this that implicitly indicates a split personality or some type of duality. I mean, that's a big kind of, that's a big, note to play so to speak so to speak if you're thinking of it in musical terms if you shot somebody like this who's an unreliable narrator or clearly a liar or duplicitous in some manner um, this kind of frame you know is a much bigger note in terms of the way that you want the audience to see them than if you just shot something straight on you know there's that great hbo documentary the jinx you know and if they shot that gentleman who was accused of three murders with this kind of stylization, you know, does that say, would that have been something that was too heavy a hand in terms of the storytelling? Um, you have to make these choices. You have to make these judgments. Um, uh, let's see, where else are we going? We have some, hold on, I'm gonna stop this screen share for a minute. And then, um, so that's just like a basic run through of what framing and some focal length choices um, but you can see, like, for the most part, if you're doing interview work in documentary, there's a large, I mean, I know sometimes when you're shooting doc, uh, interviews, it can end up feeling like you end up shooting something that's just fairly basic, but it doesn't have to be. The question really comes into, like, if you're trying to tell a story, how much of that story are you telling? You know, like, I've, we've um, done, I've done projects with Gorman, and I've done projects with other people where, you know, things end up being a bit drier in terms of the uh, the interviews or the pieces. 
and when you start to get into a place where you feel like maybe you need to create some type of vibe or create some type of energy with the camera work, then you can make choices like these to be able to, to, uh, to kind of amplify certain things if you wish. Um, but you have to be very, very careful about how you implement it. I wouldn't just do it arbitrarily if that's something it should be talked through beforehand. You guys should have a roadmap. Oftentimes when we're doing uh, uh, narrative work, we'll end up, we'll end up talking about, um, we'll end up shot listing because the choice of lenses and the choice of, of how you frame something has very specific emotional uh, effects on, on, on characters and scenes. And the same is true when it comes to documentary work. So anytime you make a choice like one of these, you, you should very carefully kind of consider how you're using camera. Um, I'm going to answer, I'm going to answer this live. Hold on. All right, here we go. Uh, so for the question is for that kind of framing, the one with, with the mirror, which I'm, uh, which is the one we just saw from Swallow. Uh, would you have it for the whole film or just a section? Thanks. Well, that's another, that's actually another question in terms of like shooting um, uh, interviews. If you're doing, hold on, somebody's calling me. Yeah, sorry, somebody's doing something. Anyway, um, I, I don't, like, if you have a subject that's, like, really difficult, you're limited time, um, I would end up shooting documentary stuff. We'd end up shooting an interview, and we'd end up, if we wanted to have some variety of shots, we would end up structuring interviews. Like, say, if we have an hour and a half with somebody, you know, we would end up structuring, like, a shot list. Be like, okay, let's do a 20-minute section. We'll do a 20-minute section. We'll do a 20-minute section you know, for an hour-long um, thing, and then we'd do three different kinds of camera setups if we wanted to have a lot of different choices. So it's like, so the framing with the mirror, maybe you want to do a bit of the mirror, you want to do uh, uh, the mirror shot and something else for one 20 minute section, then you move your subject to another part of the house and then you do another 20 minute section. Um, I don't necessarily feel the need to uh, stick in one place for one shot for an interview. Um, oftentimes, if I know I don't have a ton of stuff to be able to differentiate, I will end up setting up the structures for interviews where I can shoot multiple sizes and mul multiple different kinds of things. Um, and then the question is always, I would always end up telling, uh, I, if, if I feel like something's very specific, like a very close, a very tight close up, I will sometimes tell the subject, like this camera is very close. There's not a ton, I wouldn't tell them like, exactly what I'm shooting, but I might tell them like, listen, it's a very, very specific thing if you could just hold yourself here, you know, but then for me, I'm, especially when it comes to if I'm doing like one subject over a 40 minute film or a 30 minutes a short subject, you know, I might want a bunch of different options and be able to uh, affect my edit and just be able to create some differentiation in terms of the sizing. Um, what cameras are the essential ones for documentaries? I mean, for me, I don't think there's any really essential camera for documentaries. Um, I think it really depends on when you're choosing a camera for yourself, what you should really consider because so many of the cameras that shoot now shoot incredible quality video uh, with something as small as that this DSLR size. I mean, this is a film camera, remember, but a DSLR, a Sony A7, um, A7 R2, is not much bigger than this, you know? And you can end up shooting a 4K or 6K image off of a camera that small. The real question for, in terms of the essentials for a camera is what are, your, uh, what are your limitations in terms of yourself as a filmmaker? You know, if you're the kind of person who ends up doing one man band kind of stuff or one woman band kind of stuff, if you're by yourself, like having giant pieces of equipment does not help you. You know, you need to be able to move quickly or be able to capture things with the with a limited amount of help than a small DSLR and maybe a small two foot slider and a, and a tripod is going to be more than enough for you in terms of capturing quality material. Um, and also all the stuff I just showed you in terms of sizing, you know, those are just that's framing, you know, and that's the your most effective cost effective time effective way to be able to create interesting shots is framing. And all that takes is cameras and a tripod to be able to lock off and make choices about composition. You know, and that's really the storytelling aspect of it because it's the most cost effective, it's the most time effective thing for you. Um, I think, uh, so for me, 
essential cameras are any of the DSLR cameras that you can get that kind of allow you to shoot for long periods of time with the minimal amount of effort and fuss. Um, it, I mean, Ari Alexas and those in Sony Venice and all these kind of high-end cameras are beautiful cameras, but, you know, they take a couple of people to set up. It takes a heck of a lot more time. You know, if you're looking to step into a higher range of camera, I mean, Red has a new camera coming out called the Komodo, which is basically not that much bigger than my fist. And it's like, it's shoots an incredible range of cameras, uh, incredible, incredible range of imagery uh, for something that doesn't cost that much money. But if it was for me, I'd be looking at something like a GH5 or one of the Sony cameras, something like that. But the DSLR form factor is pretty huge. I mean, there's a reason why Gorman shoots with three or four of them. He can have three or four cameras in one set bag and be able to shoot a bunch and, and, and only do the work himself. When we used to shoot with bigger cameras, I mean, it was murder to be able to carry all that stuff around. Um, and uh, at the end of the day, if you're shooting for 12 hours a day, if you're traveling over the city, shooting multiple subjects, uh, having smaller equipment that still gives you the quality you want over the course of those days is going to be more helpful to you because you could get physically burned out. So uh, Edwin is asking, I think you mentioned during changing aspect ratios with the same film. Do you have examples of docs that do that or titles of docs that do that? Um, I have my, I'll, I'll include my email and phone number in the chat. Um, for me, I can't think of really specific examples of changing, but I don't think that that has any kind of impact upon what you're trying to do. I think, like, I don't think you have to be a slave to aspect ratio is what I'm saying. Um, I'm trying to say this as clearly as I can. The, the idea of aspect ratio to me is more about like being a paintbrush. Um, and especially for documentaries where I think you can have a different kind of language from moment to moment, subject to subject. I don't think it's distracting. It's definitely a choice, but you know, I don't shoot the same kind of things when I'm doing still work. I don't shoot the same sizes. You know, I'll shoot panoramic shots. I will shoot uh, one to one portraiture. I will shoot uh, 35 millimeter frames. Uh, I'm just telling stories with the frame. So for me, uh, I don't particularly think it's a, it's a big deal. I think what ends up having to happen with the changing of aspect ratios is that there's a specific intent and plan. You know, like for, I, I think if you feel like shooting one-to-one -one, like classic portraiture suits your documentary for this particular sense of subject. Like if I'm shooting subjects, I want it to be one-to-one. -one. If I'm shooting recreations, I want it to be cinematic and I want to shoot two, three, five. Um, you know, there's a reason why a lot of those, or it's like, or if you want to use more expressive lighting in your, in your, uh, your recreations, if, uh, if you're doing something like that, like if you look at the stuff that Errol Morris was doing with the cinematographer, Robert Richardson, the recreations they do in, uh, standard operating procedure and fast, cheap and out of control are preposterously ex evocative photography. I mean, it's, it's so stylized. But that, to me, cuts really, really well with the kind of simple, naturalistic, kind of clean interview style that they were employing in that movie. You know, if you can look, actually, that's a good contrast. If you look at standard operating procedure and the way that stuff is lit in terms of the seriousness of the subject matter and the specificity of, the, of, of what they're dealing with, that kind of story, you know, there's a certain weight and heaviness to the interview work and standard operating procedure and those recreations. And then you go to something like fast keeping out of control, which has this wonderful irreverence to it. You know, you can, you can see that there's a lightness, there's a kind of, there's, it's about intellectual kind of expression intrigue. There's a certain kind of fun and kind of a certain like discovery to that film in terms of the photography and the, and the, and the, uh, the interviews to me. That has a completely different energy. Now, both those films deal with very stylized recreations, but then, and both shot by Richardson, but then watch the way and see the way emotionally you feel when you're watching the recreations and standard operating procedure. They have this almost like terrifying aspect to it. It's beautiful in this kind of really dark and uh, some melancholy, but like really kind of like this 
ferocious kind of energy to it. And then the same kind of like super stylized recreation work and, and, and uh, almost, uh, it's almost like photo essay work in Fast Heap and Out of Control has this kind of lightness and beauty to it. And it's like, if you can, those are two films actually good to watch back to back just to see how different similar kind of styles can be employed to create different emotions within the context of the documentary. So um, I will, Edwin, I will try and build a list. I'll give you guys my email. And then if you have any questions about anything, you can send it to me. Hold on. Uh, I'm just going to put this in the chat. I could wait for Gorman to do this at the end, but I don't think it's, why wait? That's my phone number and email. So if anyone has any questions, Edwin, you can follow, I will follow, I'll follow up about this aspect ratio stuff. Um, so Agnes is asking, what's your take on using green screen for an interview during the super limited times of travel and social distancing? Regular shoots are mostly paused. What do you suggest if we are constrained to an online interview? Well, I mean, if you're, if you're, this is what I would do if I was stuck with Zoom, frankly, um, and I had to do an online interview. I would ask for photos of wherever this person was going to do their interview. If they're going to be in their house, could you do me a favor and just take a couple shots? Like they can do a wide angle, such as any kind of room that they have in the house. Uh, and green screen's fine, you know, but green screen has a certain, it's kind of funny because we're talking about cinematic choices and artificiality. Hey, Rich, can you close this window? Sorry, guys. You're probably hearing this lawnmower and this backing up truck in the background. Um, green screens. So, I mean, even with the best green screen work and the best kind of compositing, there's a real danger with green screen for me. Um, you don't see the email in the chat. Did I mess this up? Hmm. Sorry, guys. I don't know why that's not showing up. Actually, you know, Connie, I'll send it to you specifically, see if that helps. So, but, but with green screen stuff, it's like, unless you have somebody really, unless the lighting is really careful and uh, unless the lighting is really careful with green screen stuff and unless the, the background you're using for the green screen kind of like connects in some capacity to the lighting you're using on the subject, it could end up being really kind of distracting much like this beeping noise behind us. Um, so I would be careful with green screen stuff just because of the nature of how it can almost be distracting in terms of the artificiality of it if it's not done well. Um, but if you're stuck with someone doing an online interview, ask them to run a walk around their house or whatever space you're gonna be able to do the interview in and ask them to take photos of the place. You know, because then you can actually see if there's something that's more applicable. Maybe there's a room with a better wall color Maybe you can put them into a, a kitchen and there's a couple of background, uh, background windows that are more attractive, you know, like, but the great thing to remember about doing a Zoom interview is unless they have lighting on, of their own uh, in the space, the key to that is like anytime there's a bright window behind somebody's face like this, you're going to have very little control over how their faces are seen. So if you're going to be in a space I would try and put somebody uh, with a window to their side so that you have a bigger, better chance for light to wrap around their face better. Or I would try and do something where the windows are in front of them so that at least there's a more, uh, there's a more consistent light being pushed onto the front of their face and you'd get better exposure. The danger with having this bright of a highlight behind somebody's face if you're doing an online interview is um, depending on the quality of their camera, which you're also gonna be subjected to, you know, like you could end up getting this kind of, if you can see that halation effect, that's really kind of creating this almost like cloudy look on my face. And then as soon as we move out of that highlight, you know, the, the light on the face looks much better. But the reason why my particular, I'm using a good quality MacBook as well. Um, the reason why there's so much grain here, if you can see this noise, I'm gonna try and point to it, this noise up in the frame here, is because this camera is straining to hold exposure on my face and, and all this kind of information, explosive exposure out here. So it's basically trying to lift up my face exposure and that's why you're getting all this noise 
in the image. Now, if we did this, you know, there's a lot less noise, at least in this area. But again, it's like having this thing right next to my face. So, you know, so you have to be very careful with when you're doing zooms. Yeah, you, know, you just, you know, like this probably isn't the best thing for you. If you were using a high quality camera in a setting, you'd be able to hold this detail a little bit better. But if you're stuck using zooms, I would not put this the, the big hot window behind somebody's head unless they had an equal powerfully window in front of them or on the side of them. It's just, it's just too much information for these low end computer cameras to be able to handle. So, um, does anyone, um, does anyone else have any kind of questions? Cause there's other stuff to tackle in terms of recreations and whatnot, uh, in terms of like lighting and whatnot, but I'm not sure how much farther you guys want to get into, uh, that kind of stuff. But I will say just a few more things in terms of camera movement. Um, if you're by yourself or you're limited, the reason why I brought up framing and that stuff being so important is because if you have a tripod and you know, you have a lens that, or one lens that has a wide angle and a telephoto within the context of the zoom, like those are the easiest things for you to be able to, to make something look cinematic without a ton of uh, effort. Um, if you're doing, I've had friends who have done documentaries handheld because they like that kind of subjective camera. They like the human feel of someone hand holding a camera. That doesn't have to be hand holding. It could be like a camera on a pillow, but you know, like I didn't walk work with friends who like the feel of even in an interview setting when someone's just sitting in a room, like a handheld camera, they just like that kind of human connection and immediacy to the camera work. I've had friends who do documentary stuff on dollies so that they get to be able to just make selections and, and ask someone a question and push in during their entire answer. You know, um, the real question is whether or not you can afford it and if you have the people to be able to implement those choices. Or I've had friends who do interviews on sliders because they just like having a bit of that energy because um, they make it, think it makes it feel like a bigger budget or it makes it feel uh, uh, just more cinematic to them. Uh, the thing about do the thing about doing a that kind of stuff is that there is a chance if you mess up on the slider, you mess up with handheld, or you mess up on the dolly that you might miss a specific moment and then have to recreate it by asking the question again. But then again, I've had friends who do documentaries and have forgotten to press record and have to redo so interview. So um, in terms of camera movement, I think it largely depends upon the resources you have and whether or not you feel like it's going to be worth the extra effort, the possibility of kind of corrupting a moment with a mistake in terms of operation. Um, that's it. Okay. Uh, so for camera movement, I definitely think they have their place. Um, you know, especially if you're doing something like, uh, if you're doing a concert film or something like that, you know, like you're naturally going to have a bit more energy and movement because you're going to be covering a live event. You know, the question is, you know, then it becomes a question of style. Are you doing a live event and you want to make sure that you have a gimbal stabilizer for your iPhone if you're shooting on something like that so that you have a more kind of clean and, and professional looking camera move or are you going to stick with handheld? Uh, those choices are, are almost always production dependent. And what I mean like that is the, the, the amount of people you have with you to help and, uh, and frankly, stamina. It is a... Uh, Gorman and, and Gorman and I can probably end up doing a Zoom about uh, the uh, Archers of Loaf Cat Cradle show that we did where, you know, we're basically hand-holding DSLRs for two hours. And at the end of it, you know, like you can, you're, you're pretty dead. So, you know, don't forget the fact that like, even though if you're young, stamina is still a, a massive deal because as you get weaker and more tired, you're either going to end up missing moments or your camera work maybe end up being a, uh, so bad that you end up not being able to use footage. So, uh, Katie, Kate is asking, shooting a documentary in a workplace that uses masks, the subject wants to keep his mask on during interviews to stay within the building guidelines, but it doesn't work well visually. What's your take? Is it okay, is it okay to forego the better visual given the current state of things, or should we insist he interview without the mask? I mean, it's tough. I mean, you don't want to compromise somebody's health or safety even if you, um, you're having to do an interview, then again, if, how bad is the audio gonna be? Um, visually is not great, but I mean, that's the unfortunate thing about 
not the unfortunate thing about, but it's, it's, it's a byproduct of the time we live in is that people are going to understand if they see somebody with a mask, there's a reason for it. So, I mean, for me, it really depends on, on if, if you're tested and you feel like it's a safe environment, maybe you're using longer lenses and you, you get to be able to stay away from somebody. Maybe you could end up having not used the mask. Um, but then again, what are the other complications in terms of not using a mask? Do you need to create airflow? And then you're going to have a fan going and that's going to affect your audio. Uh, it really does. It's a, it's a tough question to, uh, to, um, it's a quest, tough question to answer because it involves personal aesthetics. Now I understand the fact that it is not going to work out visually, but people understand the nature of why masks are necessary, especially now. And if you can get good quality audio, then I don't think it's such a huge deal. And even if the audio isn't great, you can also subtitle if that's something that doesn't kill you. Um, but frankly, it's a more complicated question, I think, than just if, if it's being visually stimulating and you're dealing with uh, a pandemic and very, very specific, especially if somebody's at risk, if they're diabetic or if they've got overweight or have some other type of issue. Um, as much as I love filmmaking and it's really, really important, I'm dealing with that now in narrative shows is that if it's not safe, we're not going to go. So um, I'm not sure, Kate, in terms of what you're facing, uh, whether or not it could be done in a Zoom setting where he wouldn't need to wear or she wouldn't need to wear the mask and you can get a more effective thing with a zoom or if you can set up a camera close to him if you like that wide angle camera close to the subject kind of thing have him not wear uh, uh, a mask and you basically ask questions from far back and just have him answer into camera or to someone or even I and mean, this is kind of silly but you know if you had a stand or something simple and just put a red X or something next to the lens and being like, please just direct your answers to the X so that you had a specific eye line. Um, that's a solution that you could do too. It certainly removes the human connective element of it. But if you have a uh, set of headphones and you're listening from a good, you know, 15, 20 feet away and you're able to be safe and get that kind of interview without the mask and still be as satisfied, um, I think that might be a better solution. Um, because at the end of the day, it does hurt from a I mean, it is hard from a visual standpoint in terms of like removing that element of the face and not being able to see it directly. You know, people say so much with their mouths and they're kind of the small bits of body language that come from the side of the face. So it might be a difficult thing to give up, but then I think there are solutions that are, you can be able to, to shoot something like that. Um, consider basically setting up things and, and, and being able to walk away. And if it feels like you're going to tell him exactly how much frame he has, show him the, or her the frame and be like, this is the sizing of the frame. You know, this is how much room you have to move. Please don't lean too far forward. Please don't do this. You know, then you can end up getting an interview that hopefully still satisfies you visually. I hope that helps. Anyone else, any questions? Hmm. Um, so, I mean, the, one of the final things we should talk about is the nature of objectivity versus subjectivity. Um, it, it's a difficult thing, right? Because like the whole point of, of, of the objective of creating or capturing something truthfully is to hopefully limit how much that you really change the nature of the thing that you're shooting. Um, but you know, for me, and this is, we've always done this, Gorman and I have always done this. It's like, you're still an artist, you know, you documentary is still, it's an art, it's a very specific skill set in art in and of itself. But if I'm talking to a, you know, a guy who makes guitars and there's this massive, beautiful room full of half built or half created guitars, like I'm going to want to see this person in the space in that space because it says so much about uh, that person. If you've ever, if you guys have seen Gorman's documentary, uh, Every Everything, uh, like there are frames in, in that where Gorman specifically chooses to shoot Grant in the context of all his personal belongings. Uh, there's a great deal of backstory about that, but there's something really dramatic about why he has all this stuff in this specific place, all of his belongings in a specific place. 
and those belongings kind of like speak to who he is in, 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 in many ways. And so Gorman um, ends up shooting the close-ups to be able to give him those nice close-up moments with Grant. But then he also has these kind of magnificent wide-angle subjects, uh, uh, frames that kind of show Grant in his space. And like that's because like the space says something as much about Grant as whatever Grant is actually saying at the same time. And I think you have to be an active storyteller, regardless of objectivity, when you're looking at subjects and when you're looking at spaces. Uh, and, but you have to keep yourself open to those choices. Assess whether or not those choices are actually going to be worth it in the context of objectivity versus subjectivity. Or are they going to provide so much production value and illustrate story and character that you want to choose to shoot these frames or shoot this particular subject in a certain way? And, uh, and I think that's something that should always be part of your methodology and, your, uh, and, and the way you attack a, a particular subject or film. You, know, like you are definitely storytellers. You're definitely artists. And it's, I don't think there's anything wrong unless it's, I don't think there's anything wrong with making these kind of, these artistic flourishes or choices if you're doing it from a place of true intent and specificity to that's, that's, that's aligned with the story that you want to tell. Um, I don't particularly believe that those kind of choices uh, in any way really harm the objectivity of the, of, of the work you're doing. So for me, um, the reason I wanted to do this, uh, the, the Zoom in the first place, was to try and expand the nature of what narrative storytelling choices mean for documentary work. I think there's, and also you're working in a universe now where I don't know if there's ever been a time where the power of the documentary has more widespread international appeal, whether it's HBO films or Netflix or any of this stuff. I mean, documentaries used to be the kind of uh, the, 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 the side dish, so to speak, in culinary terms. And now they're kind of the entree for a lot of people. How many, I can't tell whether it's true crime or whether it's family dynamics or, uh, or, or, or it's something more specific to a specific industry like fashion or something. Um, documentary work now is as powerful and as connective in terms of the narrative appeal of it uh, as anything. So I think because it's so familiar to audiences now, and it's not just seen as something that is strictly educational, the boundaries for what is acceptable in terms of storytelling choices when documentaries are going to continue to expand. So why not be, why not use all the, the tool uh, paintbrushes at your disposal? Why not use all the colors of the, of the, the, uh, the palette? Because like, if you think that you want to choose more expressive lighting, if you wanted to use more specific kind of color washes, because it speaks to something that you feel connected to in terms of uh, uh, the documentary, then do it. Like if you're doing a story about a, a painter and you wanted to have four or five background lights and each one has different colors and stuff like that. I mean, those choices I don't think are uh, out of bounds. I think it's more about framing and, and framing and shaping the world that you're putting in front of the camera. So for me, any of these choices, whether it means camera movement, whether it means the way that you structure and execute recreations, the way you shoot interviews, the way you light interviews, um, you know, like something as simple here, I'll do one more thing. Um, just I'm gonna, because there's a couple of frames. So, so like if you're, so this is basically, yeah. So just talking about lighting, you know, you know, if you light a subject like Michelle Monaghan is lit for here, because this is basically a good frame for a close up in the, in the documentary, you know, like, like she has a really soft key light here. And there's obviously some negative fill that kind of brings contrast to the side of her face. There's a hair light that's coming over here. That's kind of wrapping around from, it's like, there's a edge light here that wraps around into this softer key light on her face. There's a highlight back here from the window. 
I mean, this is pretty beautiful and structured lighting, but it's not something that's out of bounds in a documentary, frankly. I mean, you could actually light someone like this for a documentary, and I don't think someone would say that you're creating too much style with the subject. You know, I've seen interviews that are lit much more starkly or expressively than this, but this is a movie, you know? But I don't think this would be out of bounds if you found it in a documentary. You know, it seems to be colored in a, a little bit more expressive and saturated manner than a documentary would be. Um, but, you know, that's also a stylistic choice in terms of your documentary. I don't think it would impart something any less truthful if this looked like this and it was a doctor talking about uh, the development of vaccines or uh, or investigating, a, um, um, you know, like a you know, civil conflict in another country. I don't think this kind of lighting and that kind of setting would say anything or just distract from the truthfulness. It just happens to be style, style and, 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 and more cinematic kind of style of lighting for a documentary. But I don't think it kind of impacts upon the truthfulness of it. And then if you lit something that was a little bit more naturalistic and a little less uh, punchy color wise, you know, I mean, this is all naturally motivated lighting. So there's a there's natural light coming from uh, through this back window, which is probably augmented by some type of a uh, uh, light that the gaffer and the cinematographer chose. And then there's just a really simple uh, key light that is basically could be motivated from this window, the same window that I just pointed out here. Like this is, it may look kind of like a movie because it is a movie, but this is not, this style of lighting would not be unfounded in a documentary, but this is a film, you know, because of so much of, of, of narrative tends to try to replicate motivated lighting, you know, a lot of the times when you're shooting documentaries, you're basically trying to augment lighting that's already available to you anyway. You know, they're just, they're cousins. They're just separated a little bit by the nature of what the work is. But in terms of the lighting and style of it, this is not something that would be unfounded in a, in a, in a documentary for me. Um, does anyone else have any questions or anything else about uh, documentary work or more narrative work even or anything? And uh, I put, uh, where is it? Connie, did you end up getting the email and phone number? Were you able to see that? Okay, cool. Um, I am available. So I am around if anyone wants a private Zoom I've done that with a lot of the classes I've been teaching at main media workshops and whatnot. So if you need to talk about a specific project or you have uh, questions specific to a documentary or some other project you're looking to do, if you have questions about narrative work, um, you can, um, oh, Edwin, I'm sorry, dude. Um, let's see if this works. You guys can always ask me. I'm, uh, I'm pretty much available. And like I said, in the narrative world, we're not really working right now. Things are starting to turn, thankfully, now. There's hopefully things pick back up, but I'm more than willing to be able to give you guys any kind of time. So um, if you need something, or if you have a question, if you want to talk about equipment, Edwin, I will get that list for you. Um, then um, please let me know. And uh, uh, shoot, uh, try sharing Agnes. Agnes, uh, email Agnes. Okay, let me try this. See if that works. But anything you need, guys, reach out because uh, yeah, I'm always uh, I'm always uh, available, and if uh, I can always answer emails too. So if I don't, you know, you can yell at me, but I'm pretty much available all the time. So. Um, Oh, shoot. Okay, so there's a couple more things. Any tips when you are following someone walking or doing things like protesting or playing? Um, here's the thing, like, you know, like, if you're walking and you're handheld. Okay, sorry, Kate. I don't know why. This is weird. If you're walking behind someone handheld, you know, like, the thing is, you need really good shoes. Now, if they're walking fast, and you're following someone, there's not a heck of a lot you can do. You just have to try and keep up. But if they're walking at a, like a normal human pace, um, you should always walk heel to toe and basically walk in a measured kind of walk. 
Um, and what I mean by that is like, you should not be walking fast. You should not have any kind of jerky motions with the bottom half of your body. It should be kind of like a controlled power walk where you're slowly coming down. You're not taking any big, heavy steps when you're following someone and shooting them. You should be taking slow, measured steps with a soft heel landing that rolls to your toe and try and be even when you're distributing your weight to the other leg. I can't do this anymore because I'm injured. I used to be a really great handheld operator, but now not so much. So when you're walking behind someone or if you're leading somebody, if your subject's in front of you and you're walking backwards, you know, it's the same idea, but you're walking backwards and it's a soft toe land. And then you roll your weight back to your back heel. And then you slowly kind of like, uh, not slowly, but carefully shift your weight to that other leg and then continue that process when you're walking backwards leading someone and then it's heel to toe the opposite when you're following someone um and also don't hold on too tightly to the camera uh if you're holding something by grips or if you're doing something actually holding on too tightly to something actually transfers more kind of micro energy to the frame than you think you realize until you see footage afterwards and you're like oh what's that slight shake basically holding on too tightly to the camera you know be gentle with the way you hold the camera and you know obviously tight enough to be able to hold on to it and be able to adjust focus or whatever else you're doing but your grip should not be something that's really communicating like tightness or energy it's more about like holding an egg so to speak i think for me that ends up working better because otherwise it ends up not being i mean I, and also if you're shooting with a dslr even if you have to wear something that's like extended have a strap especially if you're in a crowd with protesters or something you could just get popped and you know like and if you're not expecting it and you're trying to have that kind of nice gentle hold you know the camera can get knocked out of your hands so when i'm walking or leading somebody and i'm using a camera that's not like a gigantic camera because then usually people stay away from you but a small camera I would always have a strap on it uh, with some type of lanyard or something so that if it does get knocked out of my hands, it doesn't drop to the ground. Um, so I would do that if I was thinking. But the walking thing, it's all in your grip and how you handle the lower half of your body. Soft steps with easy rolls off your feet and transfer of weight from leg to leg. Um, do you have any brand or audio equipment that you can cancel noises when you're interviewing during an event, like people walking and talking in the background? I'm not great with audio. Um, and from, from, from my experience with audio, especially when I'm doing something at an event, you know, like it, it, there's always to me and in, in my ear, it always ends up being something that's a little bit more problematic. What I can do is if, uh, Gorman could probably end up helping you guys a little bit more in terms of that audio stuff. And also, if you send me an email, I can connect you with a couple of really magnificent pros in terms of audio so that if you do need that kind of reference, I can uh, talk to my, my friend Aaron Miller, who's done tons of work, or a couple of my other friends who have done massive kind of uh, uh, documentaries in terms of like concert events and for stuff that involves like large scale live events in terms of like political rallies and that kind of stuff. And hopefully they can give you something that can help. But that's part of what the email thing is too, because I won't have all the answers, but I can certainly help you find those answers. Um, Agnes, using an iPhone nowadays can produce acceptable shots too, especially in a place like a protest. Yeah, totally. I mean, frankly, I mean, there's, I mean, the camera in the iPhone is frankly light years better than anything I used to shoot when I was, when I started my career. Also the low light capabilities of an iPhone are pretty remarkable. So, you know, like if that's, don't think because if you have an iPhone that or just a camera phone that you can't shoot something acceptable. My friend Radium shot Tangerine and that movie did really, really well at uh, Sundance and that was shot on an iPhone. So I, I wouldn't let the limitations of your equipment define your ability to be able to make a, a quality film. Because frankly, the new cameras in these phones are remarkable, frankly. So thank you, Agnes. Um, all right. So uh, I think uh, if no one else has any questions, uh, and if you think of anything else, like I said, you can text me from that number or, uh, or, uh, or the email.
And um, and if anyone has any issues, you can reach out to NH Docs because they have my stuff too. If for some reason you don't have it or you forget it or you lose it in the context of the chat. So um, yeah, that's it. Um, thank you, Connie. Hey. Send that to everybody. Oh, there's Gorman. Adrian, I just wanted to say thank you so much for doing this. Uh, it was it was enlightening as always. Uh, uh, hearing you talk about movies or any of this stuff is just always great. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> thanks, man. Thank you. Yeah. Um, thanks for everyone who came on and listened and asked questions. Yeah, anyone who needs anything, and also like, and don't forget one other thing is that if you're a documentarian and you're trying to find work, um, you know be uh in the in the film and television industry there's a lot of bts work behind the scenes work uh there are also positions in the camera union in the east and west coast that uh for documentarians who can do bts work and you know it's it's a it's a good it's good, it pays well and it's actually you know fun to be able to get on the different sets and i've had friends who've transitioned from documentary to working in narrative stuff by doing bts work so you know there are other avenues for for documentaries uh filmmakers as well so also, reach out to filmmakers in your na in your area, even if they're not working on something now. They, I, virtually every person I'm working with now is a younger person that like reached out to me and said, "Hey, I really want to learn to edit, or I love editing, or I would I love doing sound, or whatever the case may be." And in a few cases, you know, they worked for me one summer, and within a year, they have a feature film editing credit to their to their resume. Yeah. It's really good stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Adrian. Thank you. Good luck, guys. Take care. Bye, guys.